Good evening. Welcome to this uh, Lenten Wednesday night worship service at St. Mark's Lutheran Church here in Mooresville. But we're not only coming to you from Mooresville, we're coming to you from Durham, North Carolina, where our guest preacher, Katie Elkin, resides as a student at Duke Divinity School. We're also coming to you, and by the way, Katie also works with Lutheran Campus Ministry at North Carolina State University and Holy Trinity Lutheran Church over there in Raleigh. So we're coming to you from over there. But also, guest musician tonight uh, from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, a high school student up there in Bethlehem, but who is with us tonight as well. So, But we're stretching out and maybe a shout out to his brothers back home uh, in Bethlehem if they're watching tonight as well. Uh, anyway, thank you for joining us through the through the technology of live stream as well as through the Holy Spirit that calls and gathers us together this night for worship as we uh, hear the sixth of the seven last words of Christ for our message tonight and as we can continue this Lenten journey uh, to the cross. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Our guest violinist is Matthew Blyer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. We are gathered in the name of Jesus Christ to remember his last words at his passion and death on the cross. Merciful God, your son was lifted up on the cross to draw all people to himself. Grant that we who have been born out of his wounded side may at all times find mercy in him, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to John, the 19th chapter. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, woman, 
here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. The gospel of the Lord praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It is finished. These are Jesus' last words before he bows his head and gives up his spirit, or in other words, dies, in the Gospel of John. When Pastor Dave asked me to preach for this Lenten sermon series, I have to admit, I just assumed that all seven of these last words of Christ would come from the same Gospel account of Christ's crucifixion. Despite being in my third year of seminary, I do not have all of the Gospels memorized. I did not know that the phrases we would be exploring over the past few weeks are actually a compilation of Jesus' last words from across all four Gospels. Three of these last phrases have come from the Gospel of Luke, three from the Gospel of John, and one from the Gospels of Matthew and Mark. It is is finished is the final of the three phrases that appear in John. After, woman, behold your son, son, behold your mother, and after, I thirst or I am thirsty. While on the cross in John's gospel, Jesus shows concern for the community he is leaving behind. As Pastor Danielle Denise reminded us, Jesus encourages his community and us. He encourages us toward intertwining yeses of mutual support, of taking one another into our homes, of expanding our earthly families beyond just our blood relatives. While on the cross in John's gospel, Jesus reminds us that he is in fact God made flesh. Or, as Pastor Carl Yost put it last week, in Christ, God's divinity invaded our human existence. Jesus is the God-man who provides living water so that all will never be thirsty and who can still, as a human being made of flesh, be thirsty. While on the cross in John's gospel, Jesus says it is is finished. But wait a minute, what? What is finished? Reading this last phrase of Jesus makes me pause and wonder, what is it? Is it the quenching of Jesus's thirst that is finished? Maybe. Is it Jesus's crucifixion that is finished? Possibly. Is the reign of evil in this world finished? I don't know. Just a quick glance at the world around us reveals that evil is still very much at work in the world today and that death does still disrupt our day-to-day -day lives. Tiny hands and feet are being buried in mass graves in Ukraine. Innocent young people are gunned down on our streets and in our schools. Bruises blossom under the skin of individuals living in abusive homes. A beloved family member breathes their last alone in a hospital room. A community matriarch passes peacefully in her sleep. Death intrudes upon our lives with terrible regularity, says Brian Peterson a professor of New Testament at Luther Southern Seminary. 
More often than not, I'm tempted to look around this intruding death, to look around at all the violence and injustice in our world and ask, Jesus, is it finished? Throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus does many good works from the Father. He heals, he teaches, he even raises people from the dead. And all of these earthly ministries culminate in the hour of his glorification. This paradoxical destiny of glorification through crucifixion, writes scholar Sherry Brown. So when Jesus says it is finished on the cross, it is best to understand Jesus's earthly ministry as that which is finished. Jesus has completed his mission, so to speak. His death is the final phase of his mission on earth. Or is it? Is death the final phase? The Gospel of John was written after Christ's death and after Christ's resurrection. The author of John puts the phrase, it is finished, in Jesus' mouth on the cross, and the author knows that Jesus' death is not, in fact, the end of his ministry. Every year we reflect, remember, and repent during the season of Lent. And we know that Easter is coming. The community gathered at the foot of the cross in this gospel, however, did not know what the next three days would hold. They didn't have the benefit of a post-resurrection perspective. They heard Jesus say, it is finished, and they were devastated. Mary witnessed her beloved son dying a gruesome death that was typically reserved for the worst of criminals. The disciple whom Jesus loved witnessed his best friend hanging naked in public, handing over his spirit at the time of death. Mary Magdalene and the wife of Clopas and the other women witnessed their cherished leader being reduced to the articles of clothing that the Roman soldiers could gamble over. In the midst of this trauma, they were no doubt questioning Jesus's last words. It is finished? Jesus's community did not have the post-resurrection perspective that we now have. And I bet there are times in your life where it is impossible to embrace a post-resurrection perspective within your own circumstances. You or a loved one receives a dev devastating diagnosis. It is finished? When a lifelong dream is denied, it is finished? When the depths of Good Friday threaten to linger into Easter morning, it is finished. 14th century English theologian Julian of Norwich received visions from God when she was on what everyone thought was her deathbed at 30 years old. One of Julian's visions describes all of time and space being condensed into the point of the cross. She saw that the cross held the Son of God, and because of that, it held together all of time and all of space. Even though Julian was writing in the horrific aftermath of the Black Plague, the knowledge that God holds everything together with care at the point of the cross allowed Julian to write with confidence that all shall be well and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. Julian does not write all shall be well out of a vague belief that all shall be well because everything happens for a reason. She is not asserting that all shall be well because our human suffering serves some ultimate good. She's not even saying that we have to pretend we are well when we are really struggling. Rather, St. Julian sees in a very real way that nothing 
can separate us from the love of God. All that was, is, and ever shall be is held together in love at the point of the cross. Nothing in our lives, no matter how final they seem, can compare to Jesus' declaration, it is finished. It is finished. All of it, the redemption of creation, the fulfillment of the scripture, the promise of everlasting life, the reconciliation of sinful humanity to our merciful God, it is finished. We would be kidding ourselves to try and believe that Jesus' work on the cross eliminated everything bad from our lives. We know that is simply not how the world works. However, God did accomplish something through Christ's crucifixion. Jesus completed his earthly ministry, the works the Father sent him to do on the cross. And Jesus' Jesus's eternal ministry remains. John 1.1 1, 1 tells us, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning and until the end. Even when it does not feel like Jesus' death, death and resurrection changed much about our earthly conditions, we confess that through Christ, God claimed ultimate victory over the evil powers that threatened to overcome us and our world. In the completing of his earthly mission, Jesus invites us to consider our earthly missions. Our destiny is decidedly not to die on behalf of all creation. Jesus already did that. It is finished. But maybe your mission, your earthly mission, is also to heal others in body or mind or spirit. Maybe it's to feed the hungry, to release the prisoners, to bring down the mighty, to lift up the poor, to guide the minds of young ones, to accompany the elderly, to pay attention to your studies, to pay attention to your neighbors, to witness to your faith that God is holding together all things in love at the point of the cross. The witness of John's gospel is just that. In all of our journeys, we are not separated from God. Through all of our devastations, we remain in God's loving embrace. In all of our earthly ministries, we are accompanied by the one who brought all things to completion. The one who declared an end to the finality of death. The one who brings us all into eternal life. Jesus Christ, who promises us, it is finished. Thanks be to God. Amen.
In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the health of the creation, for abundant harvests that all may share, and for peaceful times, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For public servants, for the government, and those who protect us, for those who work to bring peace, justice, healing, and protection in this and every place, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who travel, for those who are sick and suffering, and for those who are in captivity, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Tonight, indeed, O oh Lord, we lift up many and various concerns from our hearts as well as from our lips, from our homes as well as from our places where we participate in worship this night. We lift up to you, Katie Elkin, and all seminary students and seminaries across the land. May your good news continue to be proclaimed to them and through them as they cont continue their education and their teaching to see where you will continue to guide them into the future. We pray to the Lord, Lord, have mercy. Tonight, O Lord, we also give thanks for musicians, the musicians among us who sing and who play, who join with all creation in singing with loud, thunderous voices proclaiming your praise as well as with the voices of water and trees and wind. We give you thanks for violinists and especially Matthew in his presence here this night, for Priscilla and organists and her presence here this night, and for those who sing here in this space as well as at home. With thanksgiving, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. And indeed, O oh Lord, we do lift up those who are sick and suffering. We lift up those who suffer in Ukraine and those who suffer from violence in any place, in any land, at any time. May they know a sense of your refuge and a sense of your peace and a sense of your protection and your spirit to guide them and keep them. We lift up those who are sick this night, including those on our prayer list. We ask your mercies and healing power to be upon and with your servants, Sarah and Wendy, Ken and Jim, Martha, Janet, Dovey, Dana, Drew, Sylvia, Viola, John, Ruth, David, Robert, Paul, Julie, Denise, Wendy, Cohen, Donald, all those who have battled COVID, all those who mourn the loss of loved ones as well. For with hopeful expectation, of your healing hand upon them and us. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For deliverance in the time of affliction, wrath, danger, and need, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all servants of the church, for this assembly, and for all people who await from the Lord great and abundant mercy, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. And we give you thanks, Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously protected us today. We ask you to forgive us all our sins where we have done wrong and graciously to protect us tonight. Into your hands we commend ourselves our bodies, our souls, and all that is ours. Let your holy angels be with us so that the wicked foe may have no power over us. In the name of Jesus Christ, who has taught us to pray. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. In case you're still with us before the benediction, um, Pastor Vern is at the Mooresville High School baseball game where he announces the, uh, the game. So he's there tonight proclaiming the good news of the Mooresville Blue Devils baseball team. And if, in case you're curious about behind me, there are risers here because our St. Mark's Lutheran Preschool has their spring program today and again tomorrow. So it's a little bit easier for them just to leave up the equipment for tomorrow's uh, event. God bless our preschool. God bless uh, baseball team and players. God bless all our staff and those who worship with us tonight, here and wherever you are. May Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs>